This week, I'm going to teach you how to create vector images from rasters like pings or JPEGs on Linux. Also, we're going to be beginning our build of a software product that's going to allow us to create, say, a doorbell that rings simply when your staff approaches the office. Stick around. Recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's so great to have you here. It is just me flying solo this week. I proved before the Christmas break that I could pull it off. And so I guess that was my initiation. And here I am. I'm glad to have you along for the ride with me. We're going to have a lot of fun this week. Um, first of all, I had, I had intended to have this discussion with my lovely hosts who are not here with me today. Kind of looking at how I've been, you know, what kind of progress have I been making? You know, my New Year's resolution is a little bit different. I'm not trying to lose weight. Instead, I'm trying to educate myself as to my health so that indirectly I can maybe lose weight and be a little bit healthier. So, so far, what I'm doing is I'm stepping on my smart scale two times a day and I'm watching the trends and I am noticing, of course, I'm heavier at night than I am in the morning. So let's just split the difference. Actually, no, let's not take the average. Let's take the morning weight. I think that's the one I'm going to go with. Uh, but that's really helping me to be able to set some goals. That's really my intent. And those goals are very arbitrary. I'm, they're not very diet related. They're very much um, so that I can just simply see that, hey, this is where I'm at and this is where I want to be. And then consider as my day goes on, what can I do to achieve my goals in the long term? I don't know if it's going to take eight weeks. I don't know if it's going to take 365 days. I don't know. But at least I've got some kind of tracking going on that's going to be able to help me with that. Uh, my fitness tracker on my wrist is helping me to be able to monitor my heart rate. Um, it also does monitor my blood pressure, which is a good thing because I do have a little bit of a higher blood pressure. Nothing to, to be afraid of or anything like that. But I do find sometimes when I'm stressed out, it can be a, an issue. So it's good to be able to just tap into my wristwatch, if you will, and be able to see those numbers. And, and it also tracks me 24-7 and I can see those graphs throughout the day so that I can see what's going on, which is very, very helpful for me as I set those goals. Um, and, um, and it also, incidentally, um, through the day, two things that it reminds me is it reminds me to stand up from my desk, which is probably a good thing. And it actually does, like it vibrates. And I look at my wristwatch and it says, stand up. It doesn't actually say that. It's got a little icon that is like a guy standing up at a desk. Um, and that, that's me. And so I do. And I, I've been pretty much sticking to that. There's been a couple of times when it's like, I'm too busy for you right now, fitness tracker. And uh, then I feel bad, but I've been sticking to it as best I can. And then it reminds me with a glass of water, it looks like a coffee mug full of water, uh, to, to have a drink of water. And I've been drinking a lot more water, which is going to help me with my metabolism and help me to be able to burn uh, fat as well. So indirectly, again, I'm not trying to lose weight per se, but indirectly, it's going to happen. So um, also this week, now last week I did the, the zucchini pasta thing. This week, uh, my wife served uh, rice with curry on top of it. And instead of going with the rice, what I did is I took a cauliflower and I shredded it with a, sh a cheese shredder. I know, hear me out here, okay? So a cauliflower shredded with a cheese shredder. And then I sauteed it in a little bit of olive oil, and I put my curry sauce on top of that. So instead of rice, which is full of carbs, I was having cauliflower. And I like cauliflower, so it's not a 
big deal for me, but it was, it was like a really quick fix and very, very low carb. So that was really excellent. And as far as snacks go, I've been snacking on cottage cheese. It's like, if I want chips, I just take a couple scoops of cottage cheese, <laughs> which also I like. So I'm okay with that. So, well, what does this have to do with tech, Robbie? That's kind of the question I've been getting over the past week. Well, what does all this stuff have to do with tech? I'm using technology because we live in a time right now where tech can is available for like $35 for the scale, $35 for the smart uh, fitness tracker that connects with Bluetooth to my smartphone and is able to generate graphs. So using technology, I'm able to generate reports that help me to be able to achieve that. So as we're kind of kicking off 2020, here's my goal. I want you to join me for it. If you're a patron, you're going to be able to follow along. I'm going to post some screenshots and things like that that are going to help um, help you if you're interested to follow along with me. And uh, and I encourage you, if if uh, you have similar goals, that maybe we can share our progress and, and discuss that as well. Uh, before we jump into the actual tech content of this week's show, I want to remind you to subscribe to us on YouTube and click that bell. That's going to make sure that you get those notifications anytime we're live and anytime that we post any new videos on our YouTube channel. What has changed on YouTube in the past week for Category 5 Technology TV? Well, we have two main YouTube channels for this show. So there's Category 5 Technology TV. That's where you're going to catch the full one-hour broadcast of Category 5 Technology TV. And it's just like front to back, and you're watching the full hour. Alternatively, there's what's called Linux Tech Show. You can get there. It's a hot link, linuxtechshow.com. And what I do with Linux Tech Show is I take the entire one-hour show and I cut up all the pieces of the show. Now, this past week, we did something a little bit differently, or I did something a little bit differently. I had a discussion with some of the team and said, what if we did this? And everybody was like, yeah, sounds like a lot of work, Robbie, but you can do this, and if you do this, it's probably going to be a really good thing. So what I did is not only do I take all of the clips from Category 5 Technology TV, so you can watch just the feature or just the newsroom, and now I've taken it to the next step and said, okay, last week we had eight stories on the Category 5.TV newsroom. Eight stories. These are news stories that we're following in tech. So you can watch that full Category 5.TV newsroom episode, which is 28 minutes long, or now, starting last week, you can watch each individual story. So if there's a particular story in the Category 5.TV newsroom that you love, go to linuxtechshow.com. You'll be able to find that story from here on in, and you can share that on your social media profile. You can post it on YouTube. You can post it on Twitter. You can post it on Facebook. You can share it with your friends and family. So if there's a particular story that applies to you or, or those that you, um, that you think are following your social media profiles, you'll be able to post those videos. And that's a great way to spread the kind of the word about Category 5 Technology TV as we grow here in 2020. This week, I mentioned at the top of the show, we are going to be looking at how to create vector images from raster images. And what does that mean? Well, when I'm working on websites or when I'm working on any kind of graphic projects, quite often I request a vector image from my client. And the client may say, Oh, well, we don't have such a thing, or even better yet, what the heck is a vector image, right? So, so maybe that's the question I have to answer first. So a raster image or a, a flattened image like a JPEG or a ping or a bitmap is, it, it's what's called a rasterized image. So that image is set to the dimensions that the creator had saved it as. So let's say a video is 1920 by 1080. So if you have a screenshot from that video, that screenshot is going to be 1920 by 1080. Now you can scale that down and it's going to look great. You can shrink it and it's going to look fantastic. However, if you ever tried to make it bigger, so let's say you wanted to fit it on a 4K screen, well, now what you're doing is you're taking that 1080p uh, screenshot and you're stretching it. 
And well, how does a computer stretch an image? Well, it recreates all the pixels. It stretches them and each pixel is stretched. So eventually when you get big enough, you're going to get distortion. You're going to get blurriness. And this happens when you take a logo. It's a perfect example. When you take a little logo from a website and you try to print it on a billboard, well, that's not going to look good. And somebody with some quality control is going to tell you, don't do that. We need a vector image. Well, what is a vector image? How can I get a vector image? I don't have one. Okay. So then myself as a graphic, I, I, I'm not a graphic designer, but I'll use that term loosely in that I'll take your graphics and I'll be quality control and I'll make sure that it's ready for you for your billboard. What can I do to help? A lot of times you have access to those graphics as raster images, but they're not vector. So again, it's a logo. If I scale it up, if I make that little logo that's meant for a website and scale it up to a billboard, it's going to get all grainy. It's going to get blurry. It's going to get those like blocky pixels. It's going to look terrible in the end. So you want to avoid that at all costs. Vector is where it's at. Vector images are basically, the difference is instead of a rendered image that has the pixels all kind of saved on that canvas, it's a text file that directs, well, here's a curve, okay? So if this is a curve, that curve is going to be the same either this big at that or this big at that. That's what vector is. It's going to allow you to scale it up and the curve is going to stay the same. The, the image is going to look just as good if you print it on a 500 foot billboard versus, and I don't know if such a thing exists, but if it does, you could print it with a vector. If you took a raster image and did that, it would be horrible. But it often comes up in my industry and, and perhaps you've encountered this where it's like, I don't have a vector, so what am I going to do? So today we're looking at how to use Linux and free software in order to convert a raster image into a vector. Now there are online tools that allow you to do this. That's cool. But if you ever look at the source code, you're gonna realize that those online tools that do this for free, all they're doing is, and quite often, not, not necessarily all the, uh, always, and it's not always the case, but quite often those free tools are taking that raster image and they're putting it in a vector and then they're embedding the raster image into a vector file. So it's still raster. Instead, what we want to do is we want to take that image and we want to trace around all of the curves. So if there's a letter S, I want to trace around that letter S so that when I scale it up, it's going to look absolutely perfect. Well, how do I do that? That sounds like a lot of work because we're thinking in raster terms, right? We're thinking in the GNU image manipulation program or Photoshop and how we'd have to trace around everything and it would just be absolutely brutal. But Linux makes it a lot easier. So let's jump into my terminal. I'm going to bring up my computer here and all we need is a simple program, um, which I'm going to install first, but then we're going to grab a logo off of the web. So I'm going to become root. So on Linux Mint, it's sudo su, or sudo su, for those purists, and enter your password. Now that I'm the super user, so I'm the root user, now I can type apt update, and that's going to grab my latest repository information from the web. So these are the online available Linux applications. And I'm going to go apt install, and there's a really simple command here, po trace. That's going to grab a program called, I don't know if it's called Potrace or P.O. Trace. We'll call it Potrace. And I've said yes. Now that is installed. So if I type Potrace dash dash help, I should get a help dialog there. That's fantastic. All right. So we've got it installed. Now let's jump on the web. So I'm going to get on here and let's actually, you know, let's, let's grab uh, the category 5.tv logo. Let's see how that's going to work. So there it is. It's on the web. And if I right click on it and go open image in new tab, let's click on that. And there's my image. Wow, that's really, really tiny. I don't know how well that's going to scale. You probably, you know, that makes me think about 
the initial quality control as we're doing this. We want to try to get the biggest image we can. We want to try to get it as something that has an alpha layer, like a ping, for example. That would be perfect. Um, and we want to make sure that it's as clear as possible. If it's got dithered edges or a drop shadow behind it, it's not going to render well as a vector. Because vectors are completely different than a raster image. They're not colorized, but they can be colorized on the like when you display them so you can say okay well that part is going to be this pantone and that part is going to be this pantone but it's a lot different because it's not saving it as the same rastered image so what i might want to do with my category 5 tv network logo that you see there on my screen is i might want to do something like grab the master image. That one looks like it's got some drop shadowing going. And I, I could probably go to wiki.category5.tv and on my wiki, I could find uh, branding and go to the category five branding and I can grab one of these full scale images. So maybe something a little more like this would be to my liking. So at the bottom here, I've got a wordmark file. And you can do that by, you know, even just getting onto Google Images or something and, and finding uh, a larger image for the images that you're looking for. So something like that will look pretty good. But notice that this is actually a ping file. Yeah, it scales well, but it's a ping. So let's save it. I'm going to throw that on my desktop and it's called wordmark underscore light dot ping. So you can see it right there. So there it is. So it's a raster image. Yes. I happen to have one that's 7444 by 2187 pixels. It's going to do really, really well regardless. It's a giant image. But what if you've got something else? Like, let's go on to Google Images. And just do a quick search for, I'm going to do a search for logo. And let's see what we can come up with. All right, we got Burger King, we got McDonald's, we got Ikea. Let's grab the Ikea logo. Um, we have no rights to use that, but I, this is for the sake of the demonstration. So fair use says, hey, we're, we're showing you how to do this. There we go. So we've got two logos on my desktop. We've got the Category 5 TV logo, and we've got the IKEA logo. Sound good? So with this program installed, so I've got Potrace installed, and now I'm going to go to my desktop and look at the images that I have there, and both of those are ping images. Now, one of the things with Potrace that we need to keep in mind is that Potrace only supports bitmap images. So for the sake of the demonstration and just for the ease of use and for familiarity, I want to use BMP files. So back on my computer, I'm going to bring up the GNU image manipulation program. Remember, I'm doing this all from Linux. Linux is a free operating system. The GNU image manipulation program is a free image editor. Everything that I'm doing here is available absolutely free to anyone who wants to do this. If you're on Windows and saying, oh, but how do I do this on Windows? You know what? You can install Linux, and that's one way that you can achieve this. All right, so I'm going to export as. So I've got the Category 5 TV logo I'm going to export this as a bitmap. So I'm just going to change the extension, BMP, and hit enter. Now it's going to ask me a couple of things here. It's going to say, uh, okay, compatibility options. Let's open that. And make sure that this is not checked. Do not write color space information. Now we absolutely need color space information. That's a requirement of Potrace. In advanced options, we can see 16-bit. 24-bit and 32-bit. The default is 32-bit ARGB. That stands for alpha, red, green, blue. Now, we do want RGB, but we do not want 32-bit because Potrace is probably going to have problems with that. Instead, we're going to go with 24-bit RGB. So I'm going to click on that. And now RGB 24-bit is selected and I'm going to click export. So now on my desktop, I should have another file here called wordmark light bmp and when i double click on that it is my logo look at that it's still a raster image if i if i scale that too much i'm going to start losing quality i wonder if i can actually show you that you can see that if i zoom way in do you see those pixelated edges 
See how grainy that is and how blocky that is? That's a raster image because it's saved each and every pixel. So instead, we're going to create a vector based on that file. Remember, the first step is that I do need that bitmap file. So whether it's a ping source or a JPEG or whatever it happens to be, you need to convert it first to a bitmap. And then Potrace will be able to work with it. So now I'm going to type Potrace. And there's a couple of things. Now you can do dash dash help to learn more, see how this works and what you want to do. You can kind of scroll up here and see what kind of options are available to you. But I'm going to tell you what I think is going to work just fine for us. And we'll see here live on the air if this is going to work. I'm going to do um, dash S, which means I'm going to save this as an SVG vector image. Then I'm going to say dash group and dash group is a is an SVG option and what that does is it groups related paths together so it's going to merge all those into a single um, basically a vector um, tr like traversal point I don't know the technical terms but rather than having a whole bunch of separate things in your SVG file it's going to merge those together so let's group those together to keep things nice and clean now I want to tell it my output I'm going to call this logo.svg SVG being a scalable vector format and then the next thing that I can do this is optional but I'm going to do dash dash tight and what dash dash tight does is it if there's a lot of white space around your logo that you're working with, it's going to bring that in. It's going to basically auto crop that vector for you so that you don't have a bunch of white space. From a vector perspective, I think that's a good idea. Um, and then the next thing is my input file. So that file was called wordmark light dot BMP. Now I'm just going to hit enter. And as soon as I hit enter, if everything, oh, what did I do? It says Potrace, invalid option, dash, dash, zero. Oh, why did I push zero? That was supposed to be an O for output. <laughs> there you go. So remember, dash O, not dash zero. Enter. And did you see how quickly that popped up a logo.svg file on my desktop? So if I double click on that file, now you can see category five, and it's stripped away the green. So that's a problem for me. But this is, in fact, a vector. So why did it strip away the green? Well, it's grayscale, right? So maybe I can work with that. I can look at the options that are available to me. Let's see if grayscaling it would do some kind of difference. So looking at our uh, output options here, let's get a closer look and see what kind of options we have as far as the colorization goes. We've got... Resolution, scale, stretch, rotate, margin, left margin, bottom margin, page size, all these things. Oh, dash color, set foreground color, fill color, opaque. But if you're if you're not sure, there are ways to do it. There are ways to have it dither for you. But there's something that we can do here. So remember, we created that bitmap ourselves, right? And remember that what a, vec a vector is is basically the outlines of this file. So let's export that again. Let's create a new export. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to go image, mode, grayscale, and then image, mode, RGB again. So I've just grayscaled it. Let's see if that's going to do it for us. There's still a lot of white there. I'm going to overwrite that file, set the same settings. I want to be 24-bit and export that. All right, I'm just going to minimize that and see what happens here. So let's potrace that again and see if that's made any difference. And it hasn't. So our color is causing a problem with this particular vector because it's trying to get those edges and it's seeing the black, but it's not seeing the green. So how can I f fix that? And it's not seeing the white either. It's seeing that as like a background color. So back in GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program, I can turn on uh, alpha hold. So this is uh, lock the alpha channel and then choose black and right click and go edit fill with foreground color and so I've created that as a completely black image. Now I can go file export as wordmark light.bmp export and replace set my settings and export. So now I've got an image that's a bitmap 
that is all black. So now if I run that command again, you don't have to be afraid to experiment and try things out. That is the actual vector. So this is the logo.svg. This is the logo.bmp. So with the logo.bmp, I'm going to hit one and then I'm going to hit plus one, two. Can I zoom in? One, two, control plus one, two, three, four, five. And then I'm going to hit, I'm going to come over here. So this is the bitmap. You see those edges? How kind of awful those are? One, two, three, four, five. See that? Jagged edges, right? So let's do the same thing. Let's go back to our SVG file that we've output. And let's zoom into that. And let's go zoom in a whole bunch of times and move over here. Notice the background has gone too. See how clean that edge is? Because now we're working with a vector file. I've zoomed in uh, 100, uh, 1,500 times. And, you can, and it's really, really hard to scroll because I'm scaled in so close. But now... Okay, I'm zoomed in 2,000 times, which is the absolute maximum. And you can see that that edge has absolutely no jagged edges whatsoever. So I can scale that up to no matter what I want it to be. And it's not going to be jagged edge. If I open that with the GNU image manipulation program now, it's an SVG file. So what is it saying? Hey, this is a render scalable vector graphic. This is the width and height. And what do you want to do? Well, let's make it a ridiculous amount. Let's make it 30,000 pixels wide. You think this is going to crash my computer? Let's hit OK. It might crash my computer. That's ridiculously high res. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to view it at one times. And look at that. See those edges? That is actually one of the letters in our logo. They are absolutely perfect no jagged edge, because this is legitimately a vector. And I mentioned there that some of these online tools that do this for free are going to cause you to have like a, a rasterized image within a vector that's not going to scale up like that. So let's actually see how we can determine that. So if I open with, and let's actually open our SVG file with a text editor. And I can see that those SVG paths have been traced by Potrace. So these are actually the paths of the vector. Now, what you'll see if it's not vector, if it's just like a fake vector, is that you'll see that it has like an embed with um, like some ping data. Well, this is a true vector. So there you have it. And I mentioned about this IKEA logo. So let's actually see what happens here with the IKEA logo, because I want to see, I, I want you to know that this is not something that I'm just pretending. I'm going to export that one. And I'm going to save that on my desktop as dot what? Dot BMP. Enter. Compatibility options. Make sure that the color space information is saved. And you notice I'm trying to click on advanced options and it's not letting me do that. Well, why is that? Okay, there's something wrong here. If we cancel out, one of the things I can see about this image is that this particular image is indexed color. Do you remember back when I was working on the Category 5 logo, I had to switch back to RGB? Well, if I right-click on the image and go Image Mode, you can see that it is selected as indexed. Let's change that to RGB. Now that it's RGB, I can export as a bitmap. So export as, change it to BMP, and now... Look at that. I've got my advanced options back. And I can click on 24 bits, which was the default for this logo. Make sure that the color space information is saved and hit export. So now on my desktop, I've got a nice little image file, a duplicate. It looks like a duplicate, but this one is a bitmap. So now back in my terminal, let's try that one. So I'm just going to press the up arrow on my Linux keyboard and remove the source image from the last command and instead change that to ikea underscore 2019 logo dot bmp and hit enter and instantly i see a new ikea oh no it's saved as logo dot svg because of the dash o command let's see what that looks like Ta -da! so that's a vector of the ikea logo well that's not exactly what i would want remember 
vector is not saving the color information, it's saving the paths, right? The color information is going to be separate. That's something that you're going to provide to your graphic designer. Or maybe your logo doesn't have a whole lot. But watch this. Um, so if I do that command again, now I'm going to add to that command. I don't know if I can do it at the end, but I'm going to type dash dash invert. And now that I've typed dash dash invert, and I open that image again, look at the difference. It's inverted that logo for me, and now I have a perfect vector that looks like that. So again, if I open that in the GNU image manipulation program, and I'm only doing that because this is a raster program, but I want you to see that this is indeed a vector image. Now if I take that and I make it 50,000 pixels wide, 18,708 pixels high, <laughs> it says, I don't have enough memory for that. Let's try a, a little bit smaller. Open with GNU image manipulation program. You see it is vector. Let's try 10,000 pixels wide. 3,742 pixels high. There we go. All right. Hit one, and you can see those edges are flawless. Well, how's the round edge look? Let's jump up. Look at that, my friends. Absolutely beautiful. There you have it. So that is one way that we can actually very, very quickly convert a ping to a bitmap, make sure that it's grayscale or that the colors are going to convert properly into a vector, and then actually use a free tool that's available through our repositories. I used apt dash, uh, I used apt install potrace. You can use apt dash get install potrace or you can use yum install potrace depending on your distribution i'm on linux mint and so apt install potrace got me there and as long as i've got a bitmap image that's going to be compatible with it i can uh convert that to a re uh, a vector image very very quickly i've done it before i've manually traced images in order to create a vector and it's a brutal process you saw live how long did that take we did it. Let me know below. Comment below how that has helped you as far as your logo creation process, converting images to vector. And now you can take that rastered image and scale it up as big as you want it. It doesn't matter if you want to print that on the 500 foot wide billboard. It's going to work for you and it's going to look fantastic. We've got to take a really quick break. When we come back, well, we're going to be looking at, uh, we're jumping. I mean, this is my chance to be a geek, right? Nobody else is here. So it's just you and me. We can get into the Linux terminal. That's where I am most comfortable. We're going to talk about how we can create a bash script that we're going to run as a, as a cron job on a Raspberry Pi inevitably. But today I'm just doing it on my laptop. But we're going to write it together to be able to tell when people come and go from work. We're going to be able to use it as a doorbell. We're going to be able to use it as a time tracker to know when they're at work and when they're not at work. You could use this so that when you get home, all your lights turn on because you've got it programmed to do so. You could have it so that when you get to the office, hey, your music starts, whatever you want to do. We're going to show you, I'm going to show you here how we can code that to, uh, to detect your presence and do something. Stick around. So here at Studio D, sometimes it can be a problem when a host arrives. They get locked outside in the cold Canadian winter because we have it set up in such a way our studio is within a massive building. And there's a foyer between us and the outside world, and the foyer gets locked at night. And in order to get into the building, I have to first exit Studio D, walk out the foyer and unlock the front door to let somebody in. So when Sasha arrives, when Jeff arrives, when Henry Bailey Brown arrives, they usually message me on Discord. They let me know that I'm that they're here. Sometimes I don't catch that right away. <laughs> and it's 40 below and it's like freezing rain out or whatever it may be. So that's my scenario. 
Your scenario may be a little bit different. Maybe you just want to be able to walk into your house and have all of your devices recognize that, hey, honey, I'm home. Maybe you want to use this in an office where if I walked in the door, all of a sudden my time is being tracked. Maybe that's a cheap, maybe a free way for you to be able to track your employees coming and going from the office. Maybe. Well, how can we do that? Well, everybody carries a device. I've got my smartphone. My smartphone is connected to the Wi-Fi as soon as I approach the studio. Once I'm here, it connects to Wi-Fi. And what does that tell you? Well, I have an IP address on the LAN now that I'm connected to the Wi-Fi. And if I have an IP address on the LAN, what can I presumably have happen to me? I can be pinged. Can I be pinged? Well, here's the thing. We don't often do this with a, a, a smartphone, for example. We just let the DHCP server just dish out IP addresses and it's all fine and good. But Robbie's here. We know and trust Robbie. Robbie's a staff member. And when Robbie's here, we want to know about it. Sasha, when she arrives, maybe we want to know. Maybe in my case, I want to have a little light come on that says, hey, Robbie, it's time to open the door. Walk out through the foyer and unlock the door. Let her in. Maybe in your office, you want to be able to track if your, if your staff is there on time and spending the entire shift and monitoring those. Maybe it's like a who knows? Maybe it's an environment where you just get paid while you're there. Or maybe you just, hey, want to have that light come on when the staff has arrived. So how can we do that? Well, every device has a MAC address. The MAC address is a private address that's not available on the web, but it's available on the device and it's available to the DHCP, DHCP server. So your DHCP server that dishes out the IP address to every connected device says, all right, we're going to give this the next address in the DHCP pool. 10.0.0.107 could be your phone. So... Get into your DHCP server, whether it's a router or a Windows DHCP server, or maybe you've got a Linux DHCP server, and look at the MAC address of that device and set up a DHCP reservation. So now, every single time I connect to the Wi-Fi, my smartphone is given the same IP address. Whatever I've defined, pardon me, in my case, I've said dot five zero ping ten dot zero dot zero dot five zero what do you see hey that's robbie's phone so what happens if i pick up my phone and i'm gonna count down from three i'm gonna disconnect from the wi-fi you ready for this three two one click i am now off the wi-fi what has happened to your screen it's frozen robbie's now left the building or he's turned off his Wi-Fi, but why would he do that if this is being used to track his hours and make sure that he's paid? There you go. Destination host unreachable. I'm going to reestablish my Wi-Fi connection just by pushing the Wi-Fi button on my phone in three, two, one, now. And let's see how long it takes. So I've now approached the building, and guess what? Robbie's back, right? So we know that that's the case. Well, how can we use that information for good? Well, easy peasy. I always make things easy for you. Head on over to my GitHub, github.com slash cat5tv slash Linux tools. Linux dash tools, I should say. And there's a script there called Wi-Fi Check. Let's do it. Click on it. Click on RAW. And let's download it. Save as. And I'm going to throw that on my desktop. It's calling it a .txt. Whatever. I'll rename it. And now let's jump into my terminal. Go to my desktop. Move Wi-Fi Check.txt to Wi-Fi Check. Dot. Dot. All right. Ch mod plus x Wi-Fi ch uh, dash check. So now that file is executable. All right. So now I need to create a config file. So I'm going to call that Wi-Fi dash check dot CFG. So echo 
and we're going to go 10.0.0.50 was my established IP address, right? So I'm going to save that to Wi-Fi-check.cfg. So now if I nano that file, look at this. Oh, no, not Wi-Fi check. .cfg, .cfg. There it is, 10.0.0.5.0. So if Sasha brings in her smartphone, I'm going to assign a, a static IP address to her, which is going to be 10.0.0.51. Okay, so let's pretend. So I've added that to the .cfg file. So now if I run that file, Wi-Fi-check, what do you see? 10.0.0.50 equals 1. 10.0.0.51 equals 0. Well, what does that tell us? Okay, so we've established Robbie's .50, Sasha's .51. Do you see Sasha? Sasha's not here. Robbie is. So Robbie equals 1. Sasha equals 0. One point for Robbie. So now, programmatically, we can say, okay, well, we can, we can program that, we can change that, we can manipulate that to say, okay, is Robbie online? And we can run that as a cron job, right? Okay, so similarly, let's take my smartphone and I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi. So now my Wi-Fi is off. I'm going to run that command again and watch what happens. You can assume what happens, but 10.0.0.50, which we've already established is Robbie, is going to time out, and it's going to say zero. So now we know that both Robbie and Sasha are gone from the building. I've turned on my Wi-Fi, and I'm going to run that command again, and now we can see Robbie's back. Sasha's still not here. So what does that do for me? So now programmatically, I can say, let's get an alert. Let's use a GPIO on a Raspberry Pi to be able to trigger events. So as soon as Sasha approaches the building and her phone connects to my Wi-Fi, now all of a sudden a green light above the door turns on and I know exactly what that is. I'm going to head over there and open the door. No more standing out in the Canadian cold winters. And we can, do, we can program that to be able to log things to a MySQL database. There's no limit. As long as you've got some creativity and a little know-how, you're going to be able to do this. So let's look at that source code and see what it's actually doing. So I'm going to edit Wi-Fi-check from my Git repository. So what it's done is it's opened the file, the, the config file that I created, and it's grabbing the addresses. Well, they don't have to be, I should say, they don't have to be um, IP addresses on a local LAN. I can put google.ca if I wanted to, and then if I run it, just, just so you know, so just so you know the flexibility of this. So you can see google.ca is online. It's responding to a ping. So I just want you to know that it has that flexibility. Okay, so you can put anything in there that you want, as long as it's a valid host name, a domain name, or um, it could be an IP address, as we're using in the demonstration today, for this particular use case. So then it pings it. Well, that's all it does. It just pings it. There it is. Ping. And it pings the host. And if it is up, it responds with one, and if it's down, it responds with zero. Okay, well, what good is that if it responds with one or zero? You know, what, what do I do with that information, Robbie? Well, this is why I wanted to show you the source code, because you can now say, okay, well, I know that it's echoing out 10.0.0.50 equals one. Why don't we instead, wait a minute, why don't I delete that line and say echo? And we're going to say dollar sign host dot, and remember this is PHP, uh, is up dot PHP EOL. All right. And maybe I take this one and I say, uh, well, you know what? Maybe there's no else. Maybe I can remove the else and say it's only going to tell me if it's up. So now if I run that, 10.0.0.50 is up, right? But it doesn't show me the ones that are down. Or maybe I can take that, and I'm only showing you that there's no limit, okay? Maybe I can say, let's just use a really simple command. If dollar sign $host equals equals 10.0.0.50, we're going to say... Ah, da, da. Echo, Robbie's here. 
need a boom. Okay. See what I'm doing? And then I'm going to change this to an else. So if it's not Robbie, 10.0.0.50, it's going to just echo the host name. So now I'm going to re-add Google to that. So you can see, because Google's going to be up. Watch here. Robbie's here. Yes, my phone is online. Google is up. I got some syntax issues, but that's okay. We can work with that. I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi and then run it again. Notice Robbie's not here. However, Google is up, and then I watch. Google is up, and then I'm going to get that syntax issue again. I'll fix that. Don't you worry. I know exactly what's happening there. See that? Google is up. My config file, I accidentally added an, a couple extra carriage returns. That's why. It's, it's running against a carriage return. It's trying to ping nothing. So dot slash Wi-Fi check. And it's going to say nothing but Google.ca is up. Now I'm going to turn on my Wi-Fi and run the exact same command again. Robbie is here. Google.ca is up. So do you see what I'm doing there? So programmatically, I can do anything, absolutely anything, and treat people's connectivity to their smartphone. So their smartphone connects to the Wi-Fi. The DHCP server dishes out the IP addresses based on their reservation, based on their MAC address. Now you can control events based on coming and going of your staff. I don't think I need to say anything more. I think already in your head, ideas are coming. I want you to comment below. I want you to tell me what kind of ideas does that birth? What kind of things can you do with this? I think of time tracking as a great example. Robbie checked in. Robbie signed out. Here's his paycheck based upon that information. It's really hard to spoof that, right? And I mean, if you trust your staff anyways, it's really not a trust thing. It's, a, it's simply an ease of use thing. As soon as you connect to Wi-Fi, guess what? I'm tracking the fact that you are connected. There's no, there's no tracking. There's no privacy issue here. It's just simply, are you online or are you not online? It's a ping. And as long as that device or that domain or that IP address replies to ping ICMP, then uh, you're going to be able to... In, incorporate that into your config file. Cat5 TV on GitHub, you'll find a repository called Linux-Tools, which will get you started. All right, we've got to head over to the newsroom. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. PayPal has confirmed that a researcher found a high-severity security vulnerability that could expose user passwords to an attacker. Hundreds of millions of Broadcom-based cable modems are at risk of remote hijacking. Apple is now selling rack-mountable cheese graters. And the PinePhone Braveheart Edition is available now for early adopters. And we'll tell you about the $150 smartphone from Pine64. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Robbie Ferguson, filling in for Sasha Rickman this week. Some quick honorable mentions. Last month, Citrix disclosed a critical security hole in both its application delivery controller and unified gateway offerings. Up to 80,000 systems were thought to be at risk, with some 25,000 instances found online over this past weekend. Those admins who haven't put mitigations into place by now will want to make sure that they address their situation immediately. As InfoSec researchers have now publicly declared and shared working exploit code, for the remote takeover bug. Now, the proof of concept code can be used to trivially achieve arbitrary code execution with no account credentials. In other words, they'll be easily able to hijack systems. If you haven't put in place the mitigations by now and you have vulnerable systems facing the internet, you've probably already been hacked since bots have been mass scanning the net for machines to compromise. These days with 
ransomware, for example, being such a key issue. I can't reiterate enough. Keep your firmwares up to date. Could you imagine if somebody was able to compromise your modem? That gives them access to every device, every single device on your network. And if any one of those is accessible with RDP or with Samba shares, right? Like file sharing. Your server probably has file sharing. Well, now all of a sudden, guess what? You're done. Keep those devices up to date. Speaking of security, support for Windows 7 is now over. For security software updates and other reasons, it's time to stop procrastinating. Make sure that you move to Windows 10 if you're going to stick on the Windows platform. Microsoft's support for Windows 7 has officially ended, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to Windows users. Microsoft promised just 10 years of product support when Windows 7 was released back in October 20, uh, 2009. You believe it's been that long. And now they've shifted to newer technologies. As of January 14th, Microsoft is no longer offering technical assistance or software updates to your device. And the company has encouraged people to upgrade to Windows 10 to keep their PCs and laptops secure. Your Windows 7 computer will keep working, but Microsoft will not provide any security updates or fixes or even technical support for any issues. That leaves your computer at greater risk for viruses and malware that may circulate to take advantage of any of the flaws that are later discovered. That's why it's important for you to switch to an OS that is uh, newer. Security vulnerabilities are discovered for the discontinued OS and hackers will create tools to exploit those vulnerabilities. But Microsoft will not patch those issues. Without security updates or fixes, you're putting your computer and other devices on your network at risk. If you're a Windows 8.1 user, extended support for that OS won't end until January 2023. Windows 10 was released in 2015, and extended support for the latest version of the OS is until 2025. This could also be an excellent time for you to try out Linux. I gotta throw that in there, right? While an upgrade to Windows 10 might require you to upgrade your hardware too, Linux could breathe new life into your existing computer. You can remove the discontinued Windows 7 and replace it with Ubuntu or Linux Mint absolutely free. All right, let's get into the top stories that we're following this week. First of all, PayPal has confirmed that a researcher found a high severity security vulnerability that could expose user passwords to an attacker. The researcher, Alex Bursan, discovered the high severity vulnerability when he was exploring the main authentication flow at PayPal. His attention was drawn to the fact that a JavaScript file contained what looked like a cross-site request forgery token and a session ID. He says, quote, providing any kind of session data inside a valid JavaScript file usually allows it to be received by attackers, end quote. If a user fails to log in several times, pardon me, they have to solve a CAPTCHA at that point. And once they finally authenticate and PayPal noted, quote, the exposed tokens were used in the post request to solve the CAPTCHA. PayPal said, quote, if a user followed a login link from a malicious site similar to a phishing page, unquote, that's all it takes. Follow a link from a site, log into your PayPal account, and you're done. However, Burson said, in the real world of social engineering attacks, quote, the only user interaction needed would have been a single visit to an attacker-controlled web page. And that's the end of the quote. Within 24 hours of the bug's confirmation by the Hacker One bug bounty program, PayPal had patched the vulnerability. Birsan said, uh, well, he was rewarded with a bug bounty worth about $15,300 US. And the thing that we have to keep in mind here, okay, so this is an exploit that is on a site like PayPal. So if you followed a link and created that session cookie, that 
could have been compromised. I mean, you click on that link in a phishing scam email, right? And you think, oh, well, this is a phishing scam. I'm going to back away. Well, <laughs> it's too late. You didn't even log in and it's too late. That's what we're up against here. So w w any of your staff who has access to your PayPal account now clicked on that link and has that session cookie in place from a malicious, malicious site and then later legitimately logs into PayPal after having gone through the capture process. I guess that's the, the exploit itself. You have to fail the login a couple times and then when you get it right, that's when the hacker gets your credentials. Well, you know, how does that affect me? And how can I pre prevent that from happening? I think it really comes back to password managers. Because you think, how, how do you enter the wrong password for PayPal three times to the point where you need to enter a CAPTCHA? You're probably typing it in. And if you're typing in your password to PayPal, it's probably too easy. If you can remember your password to PayPal, it's too easy. Can you remember your password to PayPal? If I sent you to paypal.com right now, would you be able to log in by typing your username and password? If that's the case, you are a potential victim. You are easily exploited through this type of attack. I don't know my credentials for PayPal. My password manager ensures that my password for PayPal is so obscure and so secure that even I don't know it. When I go to PayPal.com, I log into my password manager with my secure password, which is a password recipe, and then it enters. It fills in the information for PayPal so that I can log in. If you're not doing it that way, then you are wide open to this type of vulnerability. And I need to encourage you that, hey, you need to understand the value of a password manager. It's not about, can I remember my passwords? That's not what it's about. It's about being able to create passwords for sites like PayPal, where your money resides, where they have access to your checking account and your credit card. It's about having passwords that are so secure that even you don't know them. That's the key point about a password manager. A vulnerability in Broadcom's cable modem firmware has left as many as 200 million home broadband gateways in Europe and potentially more worldwide at risk of remote hijacking. A vulnerable user would simply have to visit a website or even open an HTML file that contains malicious JavaScript. This code, subsequently, it connects to the web server built into the vulnerable modem on the local network. The script then alters the contents of the modem's processor registers by overwriting the stack to redirect execution to malware smuggled in by the request. At that point, the code can attempt man-in-the-middle attack, which allows the hacker to gain access, for example, to potentially sensitive information sent to or from the user's internet connection. The miscreant can also use the exploit to manipulate the firmware, change DNS settings to redirect connections to web pages, um, and they can redirect to anything of their choosing. So no doubt phishing versions of every bank and social media site would be uh, something that they would think of. They can snoop on traffic, launch distributed denial of service assaults, and more. In other words, this is a bad one. Once exploited, an attacker can use the modem to do pretty much anything they want. Broadcom says that the exploit code was patched last May, but it seems clear that the fix was not widely adopted by users. In their tests, the Cable Haunt team were able to compromise a large number of SageMCOM, Netgear, Technicolor, and Compol models, for instance. Since Broadcom chips are in many brands of routers and modems, it's important for you to make sure that your firmware is up to date so that you don't get compromised now that the exploit is known to hackers.
Apple has begun selling the rack-mountable variant of its Mac Pro desktop computer. Starting at just $6,500, the rack-mounted Mac Pro is identical to the tower version in terms of specifications, and it uh, comes in the same hardware configurations as well. It has the same ports, it's laid out the same inside the case, and it has the same rear connections. The differences from the tower variant are entirely in the case itself. This variant of the Mac Pro forgoes the wheels or stands of the tower model in favor of stainless steel rails that allow the device to be mounted horizontally in server racks. It also has a removable lid instead of the fully removable frame seen in the tower. Additionally, the handles are on the front for easy removal from server racks, and some other elements, like the power button, have been moved from the tower top to the front rack. This Mac Pro is intended for inclusion in render farms, as a server, and other commercial and professional uses. I could certainly see in the render farm. I mean, I work in video all the time. So having something that's able to do my rendering that's that powerful, but does it have to be a Mac? Could it be a Linux machine with Blender running? That would be sweet. Let's, let's go that route. The Pine Phone. Oh, you knew I was going to get here, didn't you? Pine 64. Let's just take a moment. The Pine Phone is an affordable Linux smartphone created by... Pine64, the makers of the Pinebook Pro laptop, the Rock Pro 64, and Pine64 single board computers. The Pine phone specs, price, and design are all tailored towards keeping it a super low $149. So that puts it in a spot all its own. The Pine phone is built for Linux enthusiasts and developers who can appreciate its privacy focus and open source software. Don't expect it, though, to be on par with the latest and greatest smartphone, right? The goal with the Pine phone is to provide a reliable, open, and hackable smartphone platform powered by Linux. The Braveheart edition is available now, and it's intended for enthusiasts and early adopters only. We'll call it a first-pass batch. It does not ship with Linux installed. You'd have to actually do that yourself from one of the beta builds that are available. And the handset has a few differences to the final run units, mainly related to the antenna and the placement of the 2G signals. Soon the Pine phone will be available as a complete phone, preloaded with a Linux-based mobile operating system. There's no specific release date, but as soon as there is, we'll be sure to let you know. So make sure you subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications. Big thanks this week to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us. Thank you for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your favorite tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, please become a patron of this particular segment of the show. It's patreon.com slash newsroom. Please show us some love there. That would mean a lot. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Robbie Ferguson filling in for Sasha Rickman. It's been so nice having you all here with me this week. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for being my community here, keeping me company. Because otherwise it's pretty lonely when you're just here all by your lonesome in Studio D. But it's nice having you here and it's been nice interacting with you. I look forward to seeing you again next week. I anticipate that I will have hosts here with me. Um, sometimes things come up that make it impossible, but we do endeavor to have folks here um, to make the banter a little more exciting than just Robbie speaking into the void that is the internet. But hey, Maybe you can help with the interaction. Comment below. Send me a message. Let me know what you thought of tonight's show. And I'd greatly appreciate that. But in the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful week. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care. Bye-bye.